Romans chapter 12, we went through three chapters of Romans in three weeks. Um, Romans 9 in one Sunday, Romans 10 in one Sunday, Romans 13, or excuse me, um, 11 in one Sunday. And as we come to 12, this will be our third Sunday and we'll finish this portion of scripture. The reason we've taken so much time on Romans 12, it's a very pivotal chapter that for several chapters, we get the most anthropological book in all of the Bible. Anthropology is the study of mankind. And maybe even the most theological book, but certainly um, it's right up there with any book like Ephesians um, and other immensely theological books. And so this has been 11 chapters of teaching us who mankind is. You don't need to go to a clinical, secular psychologist to learn who you are. I will give it to you for free right now. You are sinful. You are wicked. The reason why you're having mental problems is because you've not yet learned or you've not uh, received Jesus Christ to heal you. Now, that's not to say that even Christians don't suffer. It is to say that to begin from a foundation that man is basically good will cut the very roots of your identity from you. And that's what modern secular psychology is. And so there has been anthropological studies for thousands of years and there's still many studies today. And secular studies teach that man is basically good. And isn't it ironic that the most verifiable fact in our world today, and that's that men are evil, is the most disputed philosophical uh, uh, reasoning today. This is, we're basically good and, you know, the bad people do bad things and good people do good things. Well, that's not what the book of Romans t- has taught us. The, the book of Romans has taught us that all have sinned fallen short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. And in Romans chapter one, it's saying that even unbelievers are connected to God in a very unique, special way, and that is that they are created in the image of God because what may be revealed about God, his creation, especially what is in them, what do they do with that? They suppress that truth in unrighteousness. They're trying to drown God out, to hide in their conscience, the moral law giver. And in doing so, they've become like brute beasts. They have, humanity has lowered themselves to the point of acting no more impulsive than animals. Homosexuality, lesbianism, bestiality. And it's so prevalent in our world today that there are several, not just one, several denominations within Presbyterianism, Methodism, Lutheranism. So in other words, John Wesley, John Knox, and Martin Luther would roll over in their graves if they found out what happened in their movements. And they're they're ordaining homosexuals. This is a great wickedness in the book of Romans has taught us exactly who we are. Collectively, as a people in humanity that needs Jesus Christ for forgiveness, for hope, salvation, sanctification. We need him. And for 11 chapters, it has taken this religion of Judaism and spoken immensely on the subject, the Apostle Paul, not so that for 11 chapters, us Gentiles 2,000 years later could tune out and say, okay, that has nothing to do with my marriage, that has nothing to do um, with my promotion at work, that has nothing to do with me getting money for my family, so... Um, When you talk about those issues, I'm going to pay attention. No, no. 
it uses Judaism as an indicative human trait, as a religion that speaks for all religions, that speaks for all worldviews, and tells us the problem with it. It's brilliant what uh, the Apostle Paul does. Judaism must be talked about all through the New Testament because it reaches to the deepest parts of human life, the human soul. And that is all worldviews that aren't formal religions and atheism and agnosticism and um, all different kinds of uh, New Age thought including formal religions of Islam and Buddhism and Mormonism. All these things are men's attempt to reach up to God, to reach up to morality and pull themselves up into a greater existence, which they call paradise and heaven and all these things. And the true faith is God reaching down to us, saving an unbelieving, a sinful people because we don't have the strength to reach ourselves up. We don't have the righteousness to pull ourselves up. We don't have the morality. And so 11 chapters of this incredible news, good news, gospel news, and now it does that transition that we've been discussing now talking about the church. Well, after all, the book of Romans is written to the church. And now he set the stage of how the church was formed, why Judaism didn't work, why other formal religions that don't have Jesus Christ as the foundation don't work, because there's no other means by which men can be saved. There's no other means by which men can be born again, regenerated, made new, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Well, now that we've established that, now we're talking about the good works. We're talking about the distribution of gifts. Some have the gift of teaching, some have the gift of exhorting, some have the gift of ministering, and that is to serve in the church and the practical needs. Some have the gift of giving, and some have the gift of mercy, and all these things, God is, every one of those gifts, not an exhaustive list, but a large list, are distributed amongst the believers in this room right now. No gift Um, No person that has been given that gift more important than the other person. We need all of them. You know, and sometimes the toe says, you know, I'm tired of this dark, stinky place where nobody sees me. And guys, wouldn't it look really bad if the toe was on the forehead? We don't want that. Each person has been given a gift. Stay in your place and just rejoice that God is allowing you to serve him. And don't feel bad that you don't have somebody else's gift. Oh, that gift is so nice, so precious. I wish I was the one who had uh, that gift. Well, then we come to this immensely practical portion of Scripture where after realizing we can't earn salvation, very important, after realizing we don't have the ability even to sanctify ourselves, that even after salvation, it's only by grace that we can grow in the Lord. Now we come to an immensely important portion where it's saying, now, behave like this. Where before, the only well that we could draw water from was the flesh. Now, there is a well we can draw water from, which is the nature of God living in us, represented by the Holy Spirit, containing the uh, nature of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in us, who behaves in a certain way that is completely different than how the world behaves. Now, before we get into this, I want to read it. And then I want to continue with an introduction to explain something I think is vitally important concerning putting on Christ. So let me read verses 9 to the end of the chapter. And then we'll discuss it together. Romans 12 verse 9. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love, in honor giving preference to one another, not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, 
rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind towards one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Repay no evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. Father, we need your Holy Spirit to apply these things to our lives. We recognize, not to beat ourselves up, but a great disconnect between faith and works today, even as much as there was when James wrote it himself. So please help us to apply these things, to know what they are. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Well, as I had mentioned in my prayer just, night, uh, just now, we live in a culture, in a society in Kenya, where the corruption is so immense, not because the government is corrupt, it's because the people of this nation are corrupt. We talk about the corruption of the government, and certainly they are corrupt, but it's corrupt at county government. It's corrupt at uh, uh, Rupa businesses. It's corrupt to start a business. It's corrupt in every aspect of society. Some of you have started businesses. It's, you didn't even realize how many bribes were going to be asked. And you realize if you don't give these bribes, you won't have a business at all. And then you're faced to either join in that corruption or to stand apart as the scripture is telling us now. We live in Kenya in such a corrupt society, it's like nothing I've ever experienced in America. Now, listen, guys, I'm not trying to, America is, <laughs> our own president don't know what state he's in most of the time. So I'm not trying to say there's not wickedness, but I have never experienced being pulled over, then making up an entirely lame excuse on why I should give them lunch or they're going to take me to jail. One of them, I remember uh, they, this one uh, police officer uh, was so wanting me to pay a bribe, and I never would, that he became angry with me. It's like, I, the, it's like the mafia in this country. You will give or you will be disturbed. And he said, finally, he had nothing. I wasn't speeding. I wasn't doing anything wrong. He pulls me over. He's like, hey, your tires are bald. <laughs> okay. And he had nothing on me, but this one day, he's like, your tires are bald. That's why I pulled you over. Okay. He says, let me see your license. And when I gave him the license, I didn't know my license had been expired two weeks. And I'm not joking you. He's like, ah -ha! I got you. <laughs> and as soon as he does this, aha, I got you. His superior officer yelled across the street and says, leave the pastor alone. And he goes, oh, gave me my license. And they've never bothered me again. Now, listen to me. You may say, okay, it's because you're a pastor. They stopped bothering you. Well, there's part truth. Is, let me tell you something. If you obey God, you may suffer for it in this world, but eventually God will exalt you. What is being described here is the antithesis of all that the world says we're supposed to do to get on top, to succeed, to have success. You could take 
a whole list of the world's ways to get on top and have success, and it'll almost in, uh, completely be the opposite of everything spoken here just now. Doggy dog world, lie, cheat, give sexual favors. You gotta do this in Kenya in order to graduate, in order to get the job, in order to get the business. And you have suffered for this, haven't you? Part of the suffering is the compromise of Christians. I know, I know the pressure is real. I know that professor, university student said he will extend your university education by two, three, four years if you do not provide sexual favors. I know what you've been through. I've heard the stories. You still have to say no. You have to see what God will do. You have to trust in him. I know in starting the business, the county officials that have showed up and said, Kiti Kidogo or Kito, I, I never pronounced that right. Kito? I, I did pronounce it right. Kiti Kidogo? No? Oh, all right, just you guys stop it right now. No. And, and, they, and, and they pressure you day after day. You may say no one day, then they don't give you the license. Don't give you the help. And then finally, after months of standing strong, you say, if I don't do this, I will now have money. So I'm going to give the bribe. I know. But listen, at that last portion of Scripture where it says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good, it is not just saying that, hey, you ought to overcome with evil with good. It's telling us the means by which evil can be overcome. With good. It can't be overcome with evil. If you participate in the evil, we will never overcome with righteousness for the glory of Christ in Kenya. You know, this, this idea of the Christian kingdom, think about this. Think about this one principle, preferring others above yourself. Think about the antithesis of that, the opposite, preferring yourself above others. Do the math in God's kingdom. Have you ever done the math? This equation is incredible. If you have just, I don't know, several hundred people in this room, let's say we have 400. And if you adopt worldly principles to get on top and you prefer yourself above others, how many people are looking out for you? Do you know the math? One. You. It's a math problem. If we adopt kingdom principles and everybody in this room preferred the other person to the right, their left, behind you, in front of you, above yourself, how many people are looking out for you? 400. Which kingdom is better? Thank you. I was trying to get an answer from everyone. God's kingdom is better, isn't it? We got a math problem with the world looking out for umro, numero. I don't know Rome, but whatever that is. Looking out for yourself, you got a problem. You got a math problem. And here's the problem with us not overcoming Kenya and righteousness. We're too busy blaming other people. Let's look at the church. And let's say, guys, if we stopped compromising just Calvary Eldoret, there would be a, a spark of revival in this city such as Eldoret has never seen. If we stop the bribes, if we stop the favors, if we stood and said, you know what? I'm not going to do this. I will overcome evil with good. As we say in Kenya, it's high time to take these principles and to apply them to our everyday lives. By choice, there are theological persuasions. Theological persuasions that's are, that create a fatalism, a, a determinism that says, oh, uh, God is completely sovereign and that means there's no responsibility. Guys, that is not scriptural. God is completely sovereign according to biblical sovereignty and we should encourage ourselves in that, but man has responsibility to put on Christ. 
James says, faith without works is dead. Ephesians chapter 6, put on the whole armor of God. Do you think he's talking to unbelievers? No, he's saying as Christians, each and every day, put on the breastplate of righteousness and the sword of the spirit and the helmet of salvation, having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace and having done all to stand, stand therefore in the armor of God. We are responsible to walk in the ways of Christ every day. And though the, flea, the, the flesh is conquered, is defeated by Christ, it still exists. And we know this to be true according to Galatians chapter 5. Years ago, I read a book that tried to convince me that the flesh doesn't exist anymore. It was a book teetering on that doctrine of Christian perfectionism. And as I read it, I thought, well, boy, that's discouraging because I am so imperfect. I, I have a keen awareness of the battle going on within me, and I hope you do too. I remember years ago, I used to drive back and forth from Nairobi so much that you can't make that trip without getting pulled over by the police and asking for that keto, kidogo, whatever. And, and, and so I, I thought, okay, why is this a serpent harmless as a dove? Because I would be so tempted to just give a, you know, they call it chai. They don't want chai. Pour some chai for them and give it to them. I've done that. They don't like it. I did it. I'm serious. I used to carry chai and KFC chicken from Nairobi. And when they told me they were hungry, I would grab a chicken and hand it to them. And when they told me they wanted chai, I would pour chai in a disposable cup and give it to them. They might have got mad at first, but then they laughed at me and told me to go away. There are ways to overcome this system of corruption, guys. We have a choice. Galatians 5, this is all that's in the flesh, murder and envy and strife, fornication and lasciviousness and jealousies and adulteries, and that's who we are. But then we're born again. And now we have love and joy and peace and faithfulness and kindness and gentleness and self-control. And now what are they? They're at war with one another. It says they are at war. Some translations say enmity. They're enemies of one another, but they're only enemies of one another when the Spirit is born within us, the Holy Spirit. So Galatians 5 is speaking to Christians. So we must take the responsibility and we must make the choice to walk in righteousness. It says in Galatians 5 also to, um, to, to walk in the Spirit so that we don't fulfill the desires of the flesh. One of the greatest tactics of the enemy, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, is to make you think he doesn't exist and there's no battle to be had. We need to wake up every morning and say, there is a battle today. It's with the flesh, it's with the enemy, and it's with the world. And I'm going to choose in the power of Christ, not in your own strength. And isn't it interesting that all it is is a choice because it's all that, he has all the power. He has the means by which we can walk. And when we walk in faith and we start saying no to the corruption and yes to goodness, we will see God work in powerful ways. Well, we get this list, about 30 things to practically apply to our lives. Love without hypocrisy. What is that? Hypocrisy, hypocritus, that Greek word. It means to be an actor, to put on a mask. Love that is genuine. And guys, we do this, don't we? Go, we go, as Christians, we go around telling people how much we love them. Oh, we love you. I'm praying for you. We love you. I'm praying for you. We love you. I'm praying for you. Love you. Praying for you. How many people we tell we're praying for? Are you praying for any of them? You know what? I, probably this isn't a good idea, but we should challenge people. Hey, you said you were praying for me last week. Did you pray for me at all this week? I've done that to people. Now, I am joking and being gracious, but do you know how many people are like, oh, no, I didn't pray for you. Well, you're a liar because you said you would. 
And listen, I'm half-heartedly saying this, but on a serious note, how often is love with hypocrisy? You know, guys, I mean, we say we love people. We're supposed to be the light of the world, the, the Christian church, and you love people at work. I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. Have you ever brought them a cup of chai? Have you ever gone to the nice Mandazi stand and good, a real good Mandazi, not the bad ones, but you bring them a Mandazi? The, the, even if they don't like Mandazi, they're going to be blessed. You know what's interesting is that humanity has an innate knowledge, an innate ability to discern if people love them or not. We know if people love us because one thing can test works. Faith without works is dead. Guys, love without works is dead. You can tell people all day long that you love them, but if you're not showing them you love them, then it is love with hypocrisy. Love without hypocrisy. Bless people. Give to them. Pray for them. Really pray for them. Love without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. That is to hate what is evil. Hate it. Um, um, in contrast with the next one, cling to what is good, it could also mean to stay away from what is evil. Separate yourself from it. I can't tell you how many people, and I'm glad that, that people do, I'm glad that members feel comfortable enough to come and talk to me about their, their pornographic addiction. At least once a week, I'm talking, I'm counseling somebody about a, a pornography addiction. And guys, this abhor what is evil, separate yourself, hate it. It amazes to me that something so simple, as, and that is to make sure that your internet access has some filter which you cannot look up pornography. Now, I'm not saying that's the only thing we talk about. We've got to talk about loving the Lord. Uh, you know, if we love him, we'll obey him. But listen, we struggle in this world with access to sin such as the world has never seen in human history. Never in human history can anybody around the world. And it's amazing. We have one phone in Ken uh, America. People just usually have one phone. In Kenya, you have two phones apiece. One like in Pesa and the other, you know. And we have unfiltered access to the internet. Stay away from what is evil. Separate yourself. And guys, if you're like, well, I'll get some filters, but there's no way I can be without internet. Well, that could be a first step. That's fine. But let me tell you something. You got to do drastic, take drastic measures to stay away from evil. Pluck out your eye, cut off your hand. It's better to go into heaven with one eye than go into hell with two. It's better to go into heaven with two, uh, one hand than go into hell with two hands. Take drastic steps to stay away from evil, to separate yourself and to hate what is evil. I was that guy that after I got saved, that I spent a few times, I think three or four times in bars sharing the gospel with people. Has anybody ever done that? You guys wouldn't raise your hand if you did because you never raise your hand when I ask you to. I was that guy at the bar. Hey, man, Jesus Christ loved you. And then, you know, you're there and the apostles drink wine. I'll have one. It's just not a place I should be. It's not a place I should be. I need to stay away from it. And then the next one says, cling to what is good. You know, the enemy is actively trying to get us to be close to what is evil and stay away from what is good. Look at what happened with COVID. Shut the church down? Are you kidding me? You, you want to talk about destroying people's lives? Because the spirit it goes on forever, the material body would ev will eventually be deceased, and the spirit of mankind was being destroyed because we were separated from the church. 
And the enemy is always trying to do this. And he's always trying to justify it with some spiritual means. If you don't think the enemy quotes scripture, you're wrong. Oh, don't you love your friend? Go to the bar, share the gospel with him. Oh, you, you know, on and on his so-called wisdom goes, and he's immensely smarter than we are. You got to cling to what is good. Cling to church. Cling to prayer. Cling to your Bible study. Cling to devotions with your family and, 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 and talking and thinking on things that are uh, praiseworthy. Cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love and honor giving preference to one another. You know, this is so practical, isn't it? Be nice to people. Be nice to them. Don't be rude. <laughs> I was traveling. Um, well, no, let me not tell that story. See, that was the Holy Spirit, guys. He is working in my life. I, I'm amazed on how rude people can be. I mean, guys, we need a little hospital. Just smile. Greet people. You know what? I'm, all of my examples of bad, I'm, I'm talking about America, so you guys do a great job. We'll just skip this one. You guys are a very sweet culture, nice people. But even in this culture, those powerful people don't really want to pay attention to us, do they? Don't ever become like that. Be kindly affectionate. Show an affection to somebody. Hey, praying for you, I love you. And without hypocrisy. Just be nice to people. With brotherly kindness, giving honor and preference to one another. Preferring others. Remember the equation? If we did the world's wisdom and you looked out only for yourself, you have one person looking out for you. If you do God's wisdom and the kingdom principles and we preferred others above ourselves, we have an entire body of Christ looking out for one another. It's an incredible Wisdom that the Lord has. Fervent, or excuse me, verse 11, not lagging in diligence. Laziness amongst Christians is a terrible testimony to the world. Laziness. I'm going to be honest. I have, I'm probably too impatient with lazy people. It's not something I personally struggle with the most. I have other struggles that are greater, but I really hate laziness. I hate it. it um, it's offensive. Bit of advice. Now, I understand there's different medical conditions and people, you know, suffer and people get older and there's things going on, but in general terms, if you're always extremely tired, check your diet and... Uh, um, the, the greatest way to be tired all the time is laziness, drowsiness. You guys ever notice if you wake up a little earlier, you have energy in a day. If you wake up way later, then you are a little um, groggy. I go around and one of my pet peeves, I'm going to be honest, I, I'm gracious usually, but on the pulpit today, I'll share something with you. People always tell me they're tired. Oh, I'm tired. How you doing? I'm tired. How you doing? I'm tired. It's like... Golly, man. Let me go jump off a building rather than hang out with you. You're boring. I mean, I'm tired. Uh, you ever seen those people? They're slothful. The Bible calls them slothful. They just walk around tired all the time. Uh, listen, some advice. Drink 12 glasses of good water a day. And I'm not saying you've got to go hit the gym and become a gym rat, but maybe take a walk increase your energy levels by not being tired all the time. Uh, or people, they're always talking about how bored they are. That's another sign of laziness. I'm bored. You ever see that? It's, it's really big with young people. How you doing? Oh, I'm bored. I'm bored. As uh, Kelsey's parents used to say, being bored is for boring people. Guys, I've never been bored a day in my life. I like to have a good time. I like to laugh, get out. I mean, laziness is a horrible testimony at the workplace. 
Christians who are coming in late, leaving early. You know, have you ever noticed that Friday afternoon the county government offices empty out? You know who should be left in there? Christians who believe their jobs, uh, uh, sh- they should be working hard their jobs and they have no right to leave at two o'clock. Don't adopt the same principles as those in power at the county office. Let people walk in and see you Christian there because you're not lazy. And they say, hey, where is everyone? All all the non-Christians went home because they do that on Fridays. Wouldn't that be nice? Don't be lazy. Work hard. Be diligent. Also fervent in spirit. We have to prioritize our spiritual lives. We have to prioritize the body of Christ, the teaching of God's word, reading of God's word, prayer. I'm not saying you have to be camel knees and pray eight hours a day like John Knox, but a consistency in prayers we're going to see in just a moment. But fervent in spirit, taking your spiritual life seriously. Go home, throw all of your Essex Kenyans, all of your Kenneth Copelands, all of your T.D. Jakes books and use them for toilet paper. And then go get some good ones. Go get, um, you guys should read this new author. He's profoundly encouraging, talking about, in a very theological way, the love of God. His name is Dane Ortland. Gentle and Lowly is his first, and then the second one is deeper. You'll have an incredible picture of God on He's not some angry God in heaven just trying to beat us up all the time. I mean, find a good book. Who in the world would read Kenneth Copeland? He is filled with legions. I believe that, by the way. I believe that. Fervent in spirit. Guys, that means... I, by the way, just so you know, I'm almost out of time and we're, I'm going to finish this chapter, but I want to tell you something. My people perish because of what? Lack of knowledge. God has given us a way where we can grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and forever. Amen. Fervent in spirit also means that you believe that the spirit of man is more important than physical life or material things. When the highest virtue, and by the way, the highest virtue in Kenya is to make money for your family. When that is the highest virtue in a nation, including in the church, you will compromise on everything else in order to accomplish the highest virtue. You will bribe. You will give the favors. You will compromise. We are sending our kids to universities that are destroying their spiritual lives just in the hopes that they might have a good job when they graduate. And for the sake of material, monetary gain, we are destroying the spirit and soul of the children in Kenya. I was telling somebody who wanted a clinical psychology degree. I said, first of all, and, I, and, and listen, they're, they're around, don't feel bad. I've told many people with going for clinical psychology degrees in this country. Do you have any idea what they're going to teach your children if you send your kid to a university to get a clinical psychology degree? That man is good, that God doesn't exist, sexual immorality is actually a virtue, and the most important thing is for people's minds to be right, completely separate from acknowledging they have a soul. While those professors are trying, because of uh, going along with their beliefs, asking for sexual favors from all of your children. And yours, guys, stop sending your kids to get clinical psychology degrees. Be fervent in spirit, understand. I told a mother recently, this is what they're teaching your daughter. Out in Kisi for her clinical psychology degree. This is what you're te- they're teaching your daughter. She goes, I didn't know they would ever teach something like that. She went and asked her daughter, are they teaching you these things? The daughter said, yes, they're teaching these things. 
And by God's grace, you have two people who love the Lord, who are fervent in spirit, getting knowledge. Now they're not going to be perished because that girl left that university and is not getting a clinical psychology degree. And by the way, you may sit there and say, he got a kid who had university paid for, out of university? You're dang right I did. And if I can get more, I will try. It has become an idol. Now, there are decent schools we can send our kids to, to, but let's empty out the schools that are destroying the spirit of our children. So I'm not against formal education. I just want to say that as well. But I, I promise you guys, I'm not sending my children to get a clinical psychology degree. If they need formal education, I will send them to be educated what they need, like a vocational training school. I spent too long on that. Being fervent in spirit is putting the spirit above the flesh. Serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope. We have to rejoice in hope. Guys, remind yourself all the time. Meditate on the hope that we have. We're going to heaven, man. God loves you. He understands your frame. Don't beat yourself up over failures. Rejoice in the hope of Christ. Where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. Our sins are forgiven past, present, and future. Not that we continue in sin, but through recognizing that we love him so much more and we desire to be with him one day. This is hope. This is great. We get new bodies. We get new names. I'm going to be taller for sure. We're, we're going to be blessed. Yes, let's work hard. Let's do these things in the world so we can be sawed light and glorify God. But remind yourself always of the hope we have in Christ. As people get older, they really, those who are Christians, boy, man, no fear and uh, uh, no guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. Isn't it a joy to watch older people going to be with the Lord? There's some sadness there, but they're going to be with the Lord. And they're already suffering. Let them go be with the Lord. Not euthanasia or anything like that, but we have a hope. Rejoicing, patient in tribulation. Um, The ultimate Christian goal is not to get out of tribulation, but to be patient through it. Continuing steadfastly in prayer. Guys, we've got to have prayer lives. You've got to have a prayer life. Distributing to the needs of the saints, we've got to be generous to those who are in need around us. We have to be. We have to give of ourselves and our things. Given to hospitality, so important. I believe, I have a deep conviction in hospitality. You know, my wife... She, um, she knows, and she does such a wonderful job that she has to have a lot of food on hand all the time. Because though I've gotten better over the years, I'll spring on her, and ladies, don't judge me for this, but I'll spring on her eight people out of the blue. Lunchtime, hey, Kels, you got extra food? For how many? Eight, eight men. All right, come on, you <laughs> you you're going to pay for this later, husband. No, I said, come on. And I'll show up and we, we laugh about it more nowadays than the early days. The early days, it was kind of a fighting thing. That's Kelsey's mom laughing. <laughs> you know, Chuck Smith, he's, I was listening to him teach this uh, yesterday and um, he said that there was no question Chuck Smith's um, mom knew that his dad would invite somebody every Sunday one of the strangers at church. And she knew that she had to have extra food. So every Sunday, he would bring over the new members of the church. Now, I understand. Don't put a legal box on this. Okay, I got to be having people in my house all the time. Just be hospitable. Take them, get them. Do whatever God has enabled you to do to be hospitable. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. We'll talk about that more at the end. Let me move on because it's a similar thing there. Um, 
rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. Guys, this is a problem. We get jealous when people are blessed with those who are rejoicing. Oh, you got a promotion, huh? <laughs> oh, oh, you're going to marry him? But I liked him and God didn't give him. You know, we have a heart of gladness for people who are being blessed. Guys, by the way, this is a weird thing in the pastor world. I mean, this is a weird thing for all of us, but this is a weird thing in the pastor world where some men's ministries will be blessed and the pastor down the street hates them for it. Even friends. You sit there and you say, what's going on? We got to rejoice with those who are rejoicing. Mourn with those who are mourning. Be sensitive to what people are going through, in other words. Don't sit there being laughing, joking around with people whose mom just passed away. Be sensitive to people's lives and the circumstances they're going through. Be of the same mind towards one another. The idea of being, having the same mind towards one another is having the mind of Christ. It, it carries the idea of being selfless. It carries the idea of preferring one another. Um, you ever see those people with, uh, there's an old um, credit card commercial in the United States, a credit card commercial where there's an alligator at the, the, the restaurant. There's an alligator at the table. And he doesn't have the right credit card, so he can't reach the bill to pay for it because he has alligator arms, you know. He's like, I would pay, but I can't reach the bill. You know, when you're blessing those, having the same mind, and every one of us is just blessing each other, preferring one another above ourselves, we're going to be so much more blessed than if we're just selfishly looking out for ourselves. So once again, the same kind of idea. Uh, do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Don't ever think you're better than other people because you got money or a nice home or a business. Associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. The moment you think you're wise is the moment you have become unwise. We could do a sermon on every one of these, but then we'd never get through the Bible. Repay no one for evil. Or excuse me, repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for the good things inside of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. That is to put wrath in its right place uh, away from you. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not become... Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Did you guys notice something? In the list we got with the different gifts, we are to operate in our gifts. Some are called to preach. Some are called to minister. Some are business people who are generous, who give their money. Those are the gifts. They're for different people. This is a list for all Christians. We all ought to be behaving like this. And one of the greatest ways that you can tell a genuine person walking in the nature of God is not how they treat those who they love or those whom love them. It's how they treat their enemies. In fact, in the Gospel of Luke, the parable of the Good Samaritan is a soteriological parable. It's a, it's a parable about salvation. Do you know how I know that? Because the lawyer who came, a lawyer in Judaism, came to Jesus and said, what must I do to be saved? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. He's like, I got the first one down. I've loved the Lord my God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. Because they created a system that made them believe they could do that. Who's my neighbor? And then he gives the parable of the Good Samaritan. How do we treat our enemies? As how you can best identify a Christian. And there's, you notice in this list of about 30 practical applications that is mentioned more than any of them. Bless those who persecute you in verse 14. Repay no one for evil, evil for evil, verse 17. And then the uh, vengeance is mine. Don't, don't, don't 
make people pay for what they've done to you, and then he ends it talking about our enemy. If you have never experienced, and the worship team can come up, if you have never experienced blessing your enemy, I must encourage you to do it. I never thought in a million years, I I never thought that entering the ministry would cause me to have so many enemies. I never thought of it. You know, there are the enemies I don't know. There are those who, um, you know, there's been radio stations talking bad about me in Kakamega, in Kitale, in Kisumu. And there's been like, there was like a panel of pastors on a radio station talking about how I was a Freemason and I'm Illuminati and visitors of the church were being chopped up and put under the stage. On the radio. Guys, I want to just give you the freedom here to look under the stage after the service is over. The, you're not going to find any dead things under there unless one of the mouse got caught in the trap. But you know what's the most painful enemy? Is those whom you once had a loving relationship with. That's the most hurtful of all. A couple weeks ago, I had a phone call of somebody who was somebody I love very much. And at one time, they loved me. And uh, they cursed me on the phone. Started cursing. I was like, wow. I've had family members that I've had to kick the dust off my shoes, no longer casting pearls before swine, cursing at me. Just all kinds of stuff. And it's, it's, it's painful. There once was a, a, a gentleman in this town who had become my enemy. And when me and Kelsey were moving from our old house, because we, were, we got robbed, we got gassed out in our home. You guys know the story. Uh, a sleeping gas, not a methane gas, but a sleeping gas. And um, we moved and we were moving. We had put a really long fence and we lined it with wood, slats of wood. And by the, I didn't want Betalk to have th- that wood because we were re- renting the house. He had already robbed the Kenyan people enough. So I... It's kind of a funny joke, guys. <laughs> and and um, so I wanted to take the wood with me. It was one wood that we had paid for. And I really, we were moving to a much smaller compound, and so I didn't have a place to put it. And I thought, this enemy, this guy, he burns wood to heat the water in his house. And I could call him and I could give him the wood and we can become friends again. So I called him. Hello, Brother Josh. Yeah. Hey, how you doing? What do you need? <laughs> well, you know, I have this wood and I, I know you burn water to heat, or burn of wood to heat your water and wonder if you need it. He's like, oh, yes. Well, why don't you bring it by? We can talk. So I brought it by. We talked and we became friends again. Guys, if you've not experienced the joy of doing something like that, you're missing missing out on one of the most powerful things that Christ has ever done, and that's to die for his enemies. It's just power comes in that relationship and to that Christian life who's behaving. It's not saying just a command. It's not just saying, Hey, I want you to overcome evil with good. It is saying that, but it's saying the way that we overcome evil is with good. So we have this song that we want to sing. I haven't sung, well, I don't sing this song. Guys, this ain't the Holy of Holies. Come on out. They're so respectful. Um, Kelsey sings this song. I haven't done this song. I, I was trying to think yesterday. We haven't done this song in about eight or nine years, so before we even were even here. It's called Restore My Soul. Guys, we need a real restoration of our priorities as Christians. We need it. 
And I'm not judging you guys. I know you've suffered. I know you've suffered at the county government. I know you suffer when the police stop you. I, I, I know that the system of corruption here is so deep that it seems impossible ever to get out. Taxes are on the rise. The price of bread has doubled. I mean, all these things are going on and the level of corruption is so good that it is a current that the world has us on here in Kenya and it seems impossible to jump out of the creek, out of the river. I think we're all guilty (laughs) of something on this list. And let's just hear this song And let it restore your soul. And the way it's going to restore is for us to say, Oh Lord, I want to be restored. I want to be restored. I have failed. Don't be shamed or condemned about it. I have failed. I've compromised on a lot of these issues. I've compromised on this. And this kind of list is the kind of behavior I want as a Christian to glorify Christ. When we sing this song, The key to that restoration is repentance. Say, I'm going to repent. I don't want to be like that anymore. I'm not talking to unbelievers. If you're an unbeliever, just get born again and then join us in trying to shape the society by overcoming evil with good. We need to jump out of the river through the power of Christ. He's going to pluck us out, but you have to be the one who reaches up your hand. And you say, I don't want to be corrupt. I don't want to be a a part of this corrupt society. I want to overcome evil with good. I've been compromising. You know how you've been compromising. And I want my soul to be restored. I don't want to hate that person who's molested me anymore. Hatred corrodes the container it's carried in. I want to be set free. I want to be restored. So that's what this song is about. And let that be your prayer as we sing it.